Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge after being wronged. And today we have two great stories, so subscribe, hit that like button, and let's begin. The first story. Lying politician student takes credit for a program that my friend worked on. I end up getting them publicly shamed and ruin their credibility. The second story. People don't park in my private spot after my revenge. On to the first story. Try to steal our credit for work you didn't do? I'll ruin your election. I never thought that a story like this would happen to me, but I have been gifted. Main persons involved. Jane, the liar and cheat. Me, my friend John. Justice Simp. These will make sense later. Justice Hero. Justice Beast. Other persons involved will be introduced as needed. Details left vague to obviously protect the parties involved, but I don't mind revealing more details of past. Let's begin this back in October 2018. I'm a sophomore in university, and I've joined some student clubs. At this time, I wasn't too active in the club. That is the subject of this story. But in October 2018, the president at the time, who we will call John, since they're a close friend of mine now, was working on a project on campus. This project was to accommodate certain individuals on campus by allowing them to park in staff lots. On our campus, parking in the normal lots for these individuals could mean a 10 to 15 minute walk with their temporary impairment. So parking in staff lots makes a whole lot of difference. After months of being tossed around by different departments, John ultimately got the approval by going to the university president directly. In total, John had worked on this project for a little over a year. I was later elected in spring 2019 as the club historian and then the president in fall 2019. For a year and a half, things were going good. Our club asked about how well the project was doing since its initial start, and dozens of students with a particular impairment had been using it. We were incredibly proud to have made a difference on campus. John was especially proud, since it was basically their baby that they conceived for the campus. There was even a university and nationwide article published about it for our club. Introducing Jane. Jane was a classmate of mine who was in political science and had aspirations for public office where we live. They had been in some classes and was a well-known student senator on campus. Jane was pretty well known for being liked and popular. However, with those who have worked with Jane, like my friend John, Jane was infamous for being manipulative and a flake on things that didn't benefit their own interest. Lo and behold, this semester, yes, this spring, Jane did something remarkable. Jane took credit for John's work. You see, our university newspaper publishes the biographies of each candidate running for student offices. Jane was running for president. You may think, why is this such a big deal? It's just a student popularity contest. Yes and no. Yes to it being a popularity contest, but no because the students in our office at our university control hundreds of thousands of dollars. The last reported number I saw was around $1 to $2 million in a fully student office controlled budget. If Jane was elected, Jane would have real power. Anyways, Jane had taken credit for John's work. Again, John had slaved for over a year to get the program in place at our university, and Jane just grabs the credit for it, saying that they created the program. In addition, Jane was a nominal member of the club, having only attended a handful of meetings and never attending events except in passing. John confronted Jane about it, to which Jane promised to change their bio. Ha ha, I bet Jane wishes they did. After a few days of no change, John emails the editor of the university paper and asks if they can change Jane's bio while also giving due credit to John and the clubs affiliated with the actual work. The editor informed us that because Jane was not requesting the change themselves, the most that the paper would do is place a note at the bottom of the bio saying that what Jane said was false. This wasn't good enough. By now the paper had been out for two weeks and no one checks the online sources by now. John confronted Jane again, now demanding that Jane not only change their bio, but also publicly apologize and give credit to our club. Jane again promised and we waited for another week, giving her ample time to make the change. By then it was already election week. This was the very first week of corona lockdown for our city. On the election ballot, Jane's bio had changed to say that she had initiated, not created the program. She changed one word. One word. John and I were furious. We had to do something. But who would take this seriously? The student elected officials are all an in-group, and there's no way we can get this by without some hard evidence. Then there was me. I spent a few days compiling text messages between John and Jane, emails by John from October 2018 to late 2019 to university departments, emails from John to the editor, and news articles officially giving credit to John and our club. Obviously, Jane was nowhere to be found in the email chains. Not even the meeting minutes for the university senate had any record of Jane proposing the program to the student senate. We had her dead to rights on flat out lying and stealing credit for work that she didn't do. Unfortunately, I did not get the evidence compiled before the end of student elections. Jane was elected as the associated student president. But wait, something glorious happened. A day or two before I submit my findings to the student senate, a post on the university Facebook catches my attention. It couldn't have been more beautiful. Right there was a screenshot of Jane DMing someone on Instagram, saying that if they vote for them that they'd be enrolled into a gift card raffle. 
Borderline bribery and incitement? You're darn right. In a matter of hours, the post went viral on campus. Hundreds of students demanded an explanation, with no official comment by the student senate, campus administration, or external student affairs. The silence riles up the student plebs even more. To add salt into the wound, a particular student senator defended Jane, saying it was approved, get over it. Little did we know, this person would be very important later. After about two days of no actions, I finally have all I need. The emails, the texts, the bio screenshots, Jane's promises to change the info, and Jane's DMs to people bribing them to vote. My case file was complete. I even managed to have John give me an official statement on the issue, which was approved by the national headquarters of our club. I PM the Associated Students Office on Facebook, and I emailed their office manager, and a few student senators all my findings. I also CC'd the Chair of Student Affairs to make sure that they read my email, because whenever you CC upper leadership, they won't be happy seeing bad stuff being said about them. A few days later and I got a response. All my findings were forwarded to the student court, which was the Judicial Committee of the Student Senate. I also had no idea we had one, but apparently they have a good deal of power. Enough people were emailing complaints to the office that official cases were being brought up against Jane. Two by Jane's opponents in the election, and the other by me. Within the week I was invited to make my case against Jane. Trial day. Now the rules of the student court are rather lax. If you've ever been a part of a mock trial, it was a lot like that, but with less formal rules on what you're allowed to present to the court. To add to this, due to corona, we had to have the court session over Zoom. The setup is a whole other story, involving explicit imagery from a troll. In the stupidity of it all, Jane had refused to show up to the online meeting, but was giving rebuttals via email? Before me, one of Jane's opponents went against her. For the sake of simplicity, I will summarize both the cases against Jane made by her opponents. Basically, they argued that what Jane did was unethical. Even though no specific campus policy went against bribery, literally, they still argued that it was unethical, and that the court should both recommend that the Senate amend the policy and punish Jane. Introducing Justice Simp. Remember that student senator who defended Jane on the Facebook post and told us to get over it? Guess who one of the justices on the student court was? That's D. Wright, Justice Simp. Conflict of interest? Yeah, definitely. For a solid 15 minutes, Simp was arguing with the other justices on whether or not to recuse himself. However, due to a lack of solid evidence detailing the relationship between Jane and Justice Simp, he was allowed to sit on the court. Now, before each election, every student candidate is required to sign off on a form, stating that they understand the rules, that they are accountable to all rules and regulations even if they do not get elected. For all intents and purposes, the candidates are members of the university senate policies. This is important because Simp tried to argue a technicality. The student senate rules are specifically worded to include only active student senators and members and faculty. Just as Simp argued that because Jane was bribing students, but not as a president or senator, that the rules do not apply to her. He literally said this. Justice Hero wasn't having any of it. This entire time, Justice Hero and Simp were going at it, with Simp oddly defending Jane to the death, while Hero was just trying to get to the facts of right and wrong. When Simp's argument for the technicality failed, he literally argued, how could Jane possibly know about the rules? In comes Justice Beast, another justice on the court, who isn't having any of Simp's crap. Beast comes in strongly, reading verbatim the statement on the form that Jane signed when beginning their campaign, saying that they promised to comply with all university rules and regs. Goodbye vague loophole, you've been closed. When the court voted on whether or not Jane was guilty of bribing other students, the total was 4 to 1, with Justice Simp being that one guy who refused to accept the facts. Now, my case was a little different. Where the other cases were about Jane bribing other students to vote for them, my case was about Jane breaking the policies of honesty and integrity. The student official's code of ethics is literally having a section about honesty, and a section about fulfilling obligations that you promise, and not taking credit for work you didn't do. All the justices were forwarded my case as evidence, and it was my time to make my case against Jane. I presented all the evidence I mentioned before, elaborating to say that no one does anything like this unless you intentionally lie, including the literal change of one word. My nail in the coffin was the official statement by John, which detailed the entire ordeal in a nicely approved letter by national leadership. Upon being questioned, Justice Simp tried to trip me up, asking how I knew Jane was active or not in the club. Me having a few years of mock trial experience declared that it would be hearsay for me to answer, as I wasn't an active member or officer during the time that Justice Simp was asking about. In order to get an answer, he'd have to ask John, who was the president at the time. However, I did add that in the times I was an officer, I only saw Jane two to three times over the last year and a half, nowhere near the levels of activity that Jane was claiming. Nice try, Simp, but your crap isn't going to work on me. Again, Justice Simp is stalling, trying to keep the court from voting on the issue. It's getting late in the night, and we all want to leave. I am almost certain Jane was watching from a friend's screen while also messaging Justice Simp. During the deliberation, Jane emailed the justices her response, basically saying how the rules don't apply to her because she wasn't acting in the office of a student official. Justice Simp read Jane's response verbatim and still defended her, 
Justice Peace and Justice Hero had enough of Simp's crap and call for a vote on the case. My case, being much more well documented and based on concrete university policies, held up ridiculously well. Especially when Hero and Beast brought up the ethics code about only taking credit for what you did. Simp shut up really quick. The end vote, 5 to 0. Even Justice Simp couldn't deny that Jane had flat out lied and stolen credit. I celebrated that weekend by buying some beers and enjoying myself, social distancing style. We're still awaiting the official punishment of Jane, but there's talk about removal from office, as well as Justice Simp being investigated for conflict of interest in the cases. I've never been more satisfied to ruin Jane's campus political career, and it likely will ruin their future political career. I plan to email the evidence to politicians Jane has and is working with. Update. Today the student court released its official decision on the case. As of today, Jane is disqualified from candidacy and student presidency, and the rules are to be amended to prevent others like her from bribing votes. I love this part. Through evidence provided by Augustinus 33, there was no documentation that showed that Jane had any part in the process of organizing the parking program. The student court even is changing rules to allow other justices to vote out another justice if they believe there's a conflict of interest. No one trusts Justice Simp anymore, haha. <laughs> the next story is, park in my private spot, have fun. During the summertime in my area, a lot of people go hiking. I live in the city, but the city is surrounded by mountains, and I live pretty high up towards one of the mountains, which has the most popular hiking routes. After building our house, including our parking space, we noticed that sometimes people were parking in our private parking spot. The private parking sign wasn't glaringly visible, so we thought that might have been the case. After putting up two more signs, now four total, and marking the space with private parking, people still ended up parking there, although much less. In order to park there, you had to drive into our private driveway and park right in front of our house. There was no chance you ended up parking there without knowing that this was not a private parking. So this summer, we've had two cars who have parked there on several occasions. I ended up getting tired of them blocking my driveway and decided to do something about it. We parked our car right behind their car, essentially blocking it, and went inside to make dinner. We eventually got a call from the owner of the car. She wanted us to move the car so she could get out. In my country, you can search the plates of a car to find the owner. If the owner is not opted out of the phone register, you can search their number online. I told her I was on a business trip and would be back tomorrow morning. She ended up taking a taxi home and meeting me the next morning to collect her car. Taxi is notoriously expensive in my country, costing her a hefty 150 US dollars. The second guy who parked his car there ended up having to wait while I was eating dinner and finishing my Game of Thrones episode before moving the car. The funny thing is that there's a free parking lot with lots of free spaces available, just 150 meters down the street. It was made for hikers to park, and I have never seen it full. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button.